Turn with me to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. We're getting ready to walk through this great chapter, this great understanding of what God wants from his people, this great understanding of example of not just words telling us what to do, but rather illustrating for us through the lives of other saints what it means to be able to follow Christ and what it means to be the people of God that he's calling us to be as we enter into this vision 2024, as we move ahead in the years ahead, church family, we want to be the people that are described here in chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews. Now, there's lots of keys in my pocket. I don't have uh, as many as as others, but I have a key to my house, a key to the shop. I've got a key to the front door of the church. I've got a key that uh, opens up the office and one that opens up my office. These are all very, very... You notice that there is not a church kitchen key on my key ring. The powers that be have deemed that inappropriate. I do not know why, but, but nonetheless, I have several keys on my keychain. Each of them designed for a specific lock, each of them allowing me the opportunity to move from being on the outside to being on the inside. And if for whatever reason I have forgotten my keys, if for whatever reason I don't have it, then it is obvious I am stuck in the hallway. The key is that which opens up the door. Well, for us, the key to truth, the key to to being God's people, the key to, to everything that God would have for us to put ourselves in this position of blessing, the key is a worldview. It's a way of understanding things, a way of describing things about how we interact and how this world got here and the ones that are responsible to it and what we're expecting from it and what is being expected of us. This idea of worldview is one that is so critical to us and many times it is overlooked. Because to be honest, we live in a world, a society, where they don't like to be able to say that one worldview is right and another is obviously wrong. They want to go ahead and create this, this, uh, this atmosphere that says that it doesn't matter what you believe. This is a place where you can go ahead and construct your own theology, your own sociology. You can go ahead and create whatever it is that you would like and you can go ahead and receive approval from us as far as that particular thing is concerned. And anyone who holds a worldview different than that all-inclusive worldview is one whose worldview is excluded from the inclusive worldview that is put out there. Now, it does get confusing a little bit, doesn't it? Hebrews helps us clarify that. Hebrews lets us know just a little bit more about what it is. And so with this example, we looked last week in chapter 12 as he kind of gave a summation. And he said, therefore, since we have this great cloud of witnesses, we have these people that got it right. We have these who, who are watching us run our race. And we have the example of the race that they have run. Since all of these things are true, let us go ahead and then he moves us to those places we talked about last week. This cloud of witnesses, this running the race, this attending to who we are, this idea of finishing well, it all begins with the key. It begins with the worldview about how we're approaching everything that is out there and what it is that will give us hope and will give us encouragement and give us confidence and assurance for the days ahead. That is what we talk about today. Listen for the key. Would you stand with me? Hebrews 11, beginning, Hebrews 11, beginning in verse 1. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, for the conviction of things not seen. For by it the men of old gained approval. And by faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. Thank you, may be seated. He begins this great chapter 
by letting us know the key to unlocking the door, the key to, in, in, to use a phrase he used in our passage, to finding approval with God, the key to be able to, uh, to run the race that God's intended for us by faith. That's the key. By faith. Well, what is this faith? What is the key? What, how, what do we know what it is? Well, how would you define that? What is, well, great you ask because the author of Hebrews gives us that answer. The author lets us know what faith is. He lets us know what it does and what it is about. He says there in that very first verse, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of of things not seen. Now there are times in our lives, there are those moments when we are going through difficulty, hardship, when things are so oppressive around us that we just go ahead and we go ahead and use the phrase all the time, there's a song about it, that we just go ahead and take it one day at a time. Has anybody ever said that phrase? One day at a time. I'm not going to try and plan tomorrow. I'm not going to worry about what happens in a week or in a year. I'm just going to get through the next 24 hours. And in some of our cases, there are days when it is, I'm just going to try and make it through the next five minutes. Amen. One day at a time. Now that is something that each of us have experienced and each of us have had to endure and each of us have had to go through. Jesus himself talked about getting daily bread. That we understand there is an immediacy to our faith that is not dependent upon anything else. We live for the Lord today. Yes, certainly. But folks, we are not defined as people of God of just saying one day at a time. It might be something that happens, but it is the exception rather than the rule, at least according to Hebrews chapter 11. We don't have to live in the simple survival mode of getting through just the next little hurdle, just climbing the next hill, just going around one more bend. No, without the key, that is all we have. Without faith, all we can do is just take it one day at a time and see what happens and hope we survive to live another day. But faith opens the door for us. Faith lets us walk in places we never would have imagined otherwise. Faith brings us from the immediacy of right now and brings us into the place where we move beyond the routine of life. Because if we're not careful, we get stuck. We get stuck in the pattern of, well, I get up, I go to work, I come home, I do the chores, and I go to bed. And then the next day, the cycle just repeats itself all over again. But faith, something about this thing that Hebrews talks to us about, moves us to the place where we don't live like that. We live with something that is far more. Because such an attitude of day by day, it's going to wear us out. It's going to run us slick. It's going to rob us of the joy. Because the day that is simply endured is not a joyful day. Amen? The day that just gets through is a day simply of survival. It is not necessarily a day that celebrates victory. But there is something of faith that takes us beyond. A faith in this eternal God. A faith in the God that has the plan. A faith in a God that has something more for us than just this solitary moment. A faith that lets us look up from the drudgery of the path that is before us and lets us see the finish line. A faith in a God who loves us, who redeems us. Oh, the whole story of the cross, of man's brokenness, of our sin. And of a God who saw far beyond and understood and realized and went to this place of sacrifice. Shedding his blood for our sin. Giving us opportunity, trusting in him that he would find us fit 
righteous, not from our deeds, but because of Jesus himself. That is the faith in this God that Hebrews talks to us about. That is the hope we have. That is the assurance we have. That is the promise we have. That is what brings us from just this solitary moment into something far more divine because our faith is in eternal Redeemer God. And that's what he's, hope, what he's talking about here. This hope he talks about it's not just simply a shot in the dark, a maybe, a could be, a possibility. Sometimes in your conversation with someone about their eternal destiny, the, the idea has come up, will you go to heaven when you die? Is your structure, is your thing going on right now, is it the thing that is going to take you into eternity? Will you go to heaven when you die? I ask you that question right now. When you expire from this planet, when your body is no longer breathing, the brain is no longer functioning, the heart no longer beats, when your time on earth is done, will you go to heaven when you die? I can't tell you how many times I have heard the answer to that question. I hope so. I'd like to. I want to think so. Friend, if the faith you have gives you the very best answer, well, I hope so. You have the wrong faith. You are not trusting in the Redeemer God who has already paid the price for your sin. You are not trusting in the one who is faithful and true. I'm not sure what else it is you might be trusting in, but our faith that Hebrews 11 talks about, the faith that takes us to the next day, the faith that brings us to an eternity is a faith that is certain because we trust in God himself. Faith is not a hope so. It is an assurance of things hoped for. The conviction of things not seen. This is one of those times when it's very beneficial for us to do a little bit of understanding of the words. A little bit of going back to the original languages, a little bit of understanding how it's used in different contexts and different ideas that, that are formulated with that. that. That Greek word that is there for assurance, it's a word that is a foundation of confidence. It's a word that talks about surety, one that talks about that there is a certainty of it. One commentary talked about the fact that this word is used even in legal sense and it can be rightly determined and rightly translated as a title, as a deed. It is a signed document, if you would. The faith that we have in God is our assurance, our title. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we own our home. And if anyone would ever question that, we can go to the piece of paper that is our confidence that has been duly signed and, and passed and all those other kind of things that says that we are the, own, well, in the army worms as well, but that we are the owners of our piece of property. Friend, today, when you think of your salvation, when you think of your eternity, when you think about what's going to happen when you die, it is not a might be hoped for, maybe it could be a potential. It is a certainty. Paul says faith in Jesus Christ, in the redemptive God, that kind of faith is a title deed to our home in heaven. Faith is an assurance of things hoped for. It is a conviction Evidence, the word there means proof. It means that it is the thing that is there, regardless of whether it is completely understood, regardless of whether it is acknowledged, regardless of whether anybody can shape it. It is proof. It is evidence of things not seen. I don't understand a lot because it doesn't happen to me very much. 
But I understand that somebody who would call themselves an artist has the ability to look at a blank canvas and see the painting they're getting ready to paint. The sculptor can look at the chunk of marble and see the figure that's inside of that waiting to be released. It is that opportunity to see beyond the physical, beyond the depth and width and height of that description, to see beyond the mere things that we can sense with those five senses God has given us. And there is something else that looks beyond and sees it beyond a shadow of a doubt and sees it just as clearly. Our faith does not depend upon our five senses for reality, but rather our faith defines the reality that might come through our five senses. By faith, an assurance of things hoped for, a conviction, an evidence of those things we long for, the proof. Times might be hard, the road might be uphill, but there's something of faith that says that, Lord, I know you have a greater reality for me and I trust you by faith. The key that unlocks the door of our assurance. And then he moves on real quick and he, he talks to us about the key that's in others' hands. He says that, uh, that, that for this, by it, by this faith, this faith that is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. He says that for by it, men of old gained approval is how the, uh, the New, New American Standard Version translates it. It talks about the fact that it was faith of those who were before Christ that somehow allowed them the opportunity to gain the favor of Christ that we enjoy now through him. It's the faith that is going to be described throughout the rest of the chapter. In reality, you can kind of cut off the rest of the chapter and it would make perfect sense to read that for by faith, men of old gained approval. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses, let us, and then it talks about moving ahead, as we understand these examples that come before us, he sets this great stage. That faith is the thing that our Old Testament saints had opportunity for. There's a common question, and it's one that's a very good question that is worthy of significant study. How were people in the Old Testament saved to eternity if they'd never trusted in Jesus Christ? They never, Jesus hadn't come yet. His price had not been paid. Hebrews is written to let us know that they are not saved because they sacrificed bulls and goats. They're not saved because of the tabernacle and of the holy of holies. They're not saved because of the, of, the, uh, of the burning altar. They're not saved by any of those traditions or rites. Those are ways to express the faith they had in a God who is yet to come. The faith that they had in the salvation that was yet to be secured. By faith, they gained approval. It wasn't through anything else. It wasn't through any... Hebrews goes to great length to let us know if that is all we have, we are lost because the Old Testament sacrificial system is useless. It doesn't do any good. It's administered by priests who are failures themselves. But we have a great high priest, it says, in Jesus Christ. We trust in him. The Old Testament looks forward. We look back to the cross, trusting in it and believing upon it. There is a faith that is the key that we see in others' hands. And then he makes something, I think, rather unusual in, in verse three. One that took me a while to kind of uh, grasp and still trying to understand a lot of it, I think, but yet still being able to say, oh, I'd never heard that before. For in verse three, he talks about something that is obvious to his readers. He's using an example of things not seen, the evidence of things not seen. 
He's setting the stage for the rest of the things that are to come, and he's using a common worldview, one that the readers would accept one that they would understand, one that they would say, yeah, we hold that as well. And he's saying that this worldview you have about how the world came to be, it's an example of the faith that God wants to lead you to in the rest of your life. He says, by faith, we understand. This faith that the the people of old found God's approval, this same faith leads us to this understanding, this knowledge, this thing that wakes up within us. An understanding that says that that, that, that the worlds were prepared by the word of God and, and that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. We understand. The problem today, bear with me just a moment, our problem today is that we don't share such a common worldview. For the readers of Hebrews, they they might disagree a little bit or have more questions about the cross or about the sacrifice system or about some other things that Hebrews is going to bring about and that he talks about a lot. But the one thing that they would come to is that God made this. God created this. God was the one in charge and God brought it all into being. Today, that is hardly the case. That the idea that there is a creator God is foreign with so many folks. They're trying to unlock the door to understanding, the door to see everything, to understand truth, and they don't have the key. They don't have what it takes to open the door because they don't believe in the very beginning that God created the heavens and the earth. So not having the right key, they try and fashion their own. The door stands before them locked. The door that that leads to truth and blessing and God's approval and, and all the good things of life. The door is locked to them, and so they go ahead and come up with their own keys, their own theories, their own ideas, their own ways of taking what they see and somehow seeing them work together. The statement that is wrapped around my heart this week is that the sin of such theories, evolution, uh, the, the, the idea of, of, of choice when it comes to human life, so many other things. The real sin of that is not only found in the disastrous conclusions that they make, but the real sin, the greater sin, is in the godless assumptions that they start. For how can you ascribe value to life if you do not first believe that God is the one who created human life in his image? How in the world can you believe in the purpose and intent of the universe unless you first believe that God created it with purpose and intent? in mind. It is not the conclusion of secular theories, whatever they might be, whatever discipline they might cover. It it is not the conclusion, but it is the beginning assumption that is their greatest error. You eliminate the Lord God from the equation and you will never reach the right answer. By faith. By faith, we understand that God prepared this world. By faith, we understand that God is the one who created the things that are visible by things that are not seen. By faith, we understand that. And so when we come against someone When we enter into a conversation with someone who holds 
that different worldview and has reached such disastrous conclusions. There are times when we will consider their conclusions and we will argue against their conclusions with the science that they have used to get there. Okay? There are times when we will use the moral philosophy that they've used to, 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 to undermine, to, to, to promote their own godlessness. And we'll go ahead and talk with them in that realm and on that turf, making a case for morality and, and for justice. We might argue for life on terms of the Constitution and how we are, are understand ourselves as citizens in this great country and the legality of such things. Those are all well and good, folks. I'm not saying we shouldn't encounter and we shouldn't be willing to proclaim truth at whatever point of the conversation. But both, folks, the real conversation is one. The real truth is found not in arguing of the conclusion, but in sharing with them the truth that begins with the right assumption. God created the heavens and the earth. That is where we find victory. That is where philosophies change. That is where science finds its place. That is where everything else comes together in our society, in our equality, in who we are even as a nation. We lose the fact that God created, that we are one nation under God. We forget that and we are lost regardless of the laws that are on the books. We argue, discuss, whatever word you want to use there, from the vantage point of faith. Faith in our Redeemer God. We do not believe, listen to this, please. We do not believe in a created universe because of the science. We believe in a created universe because we have faith in the creator. When we lose that, we have lost everything. But we stand upon that by faith we understand. Listen to what, what the author of Hebrews tells us. If we understand this idea of creator God, we understand that he has prepared the world. He used that word for a purpose, folks. He didn't say created, didn't say made. He's the one who says prepared. God prepared it because he had a purpose in mind, because he has something to do with it. He's not just made it and walked away from it. He has prepared it for his use and for his activity. God has prepared it. And he prepared it alone. God is the one who prepared these worlds and made it by his word. You listen to the totality of scripture and you listen to Genesis and it says that God created this world by his word and God said, let there be, amen? But you go ahead and read into the New Testament. You read the book of John and you read in those very first verses that this word is God himself and in Jesus Christ, that word has become flesh God himself God alone has made this and we understand by faith we listen to the testimony of creation and we find out that it is God's power that has made it he made it out of nothing folks he made that which we see by that which is not seen. There wasn't anything God said and there was. If he has that kind of power, what can he do with your world? If he created this universe, what can he do in the midst of your existence? By faith, we trust him. By faith, we have assurance of the things we hope for. By faith, we have evidence of things we don't see. By faith, we're not going to walk just one day at a time. We are going to walk from here to eternity. Our race is not just one step. Our race 
race is forever, folks. And the finish line is before us. And God is the one who takes us from here to there. By faith, we trust him. That's what Hebrews chapter 11 tells us. An example of creation. The key. You know, this afternoon, there's a lot of good things waiting on me at the house, you know? Not the least of which is air conditioning. Can I hear an amen? I can stand outside, but I know on the other side of that door, there is cool air awaiting me. I know there is food, and I know there is beverage, and I know there is rest. And there might even be a little bit of entertainment as I watch how things are made. <laughs> it's a great show to take a nap to, folks, by the way. Just want you to know. Great blessing awaits at the house. But if I don't have the key, I miss it. It doesn't do me any good at all. Friend, he is a redeemer God. He is one who has blessing and promise and assurance for us. He is faithful. He has wisdom and protection. He has comfort and he has peace. He is the God, Lord of all the universe. And there is relationship with him. But if you do not hold the key, all that he is, is denied you. Whether it's in your workaday world, whether it's at school, whether it's with your family, if we fail to use the key of faith, trusting in him, it is meaningless for us. For the person here who's never trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, without the key of faith, you are lost and lost forever. You are not just denied the opportunity of the, of the things and the blessings of this world. You are denied a forever with God. The safety, the security, the promise and the hope Oh, friend, today, it's time to say yes. Not by being baptized, not by filling out a card, not by taking communion or doing any of those other things that are so good in our spiritual disciplines. No, the only thing that unlocks the door to eternity is faith in Jesus Christ. The key. Today. Would you accept him? In a moment, I'll be down here at the front. For those who are at home, this is an opportunity to call. There is a deacon who is manning the phone, ready to talk to you and share with you how you can accept Christ as your Savior. And for the Christian who's here today, are you tired of going one day at a time? Just slogging through this old world? Isn't it time to run the race? Isn't it time to find out that there's more? Oh, I know there, uh, and, and I don't mean to minimize, I know that there are some disasters, some things that come along and have experienced them myself within our family. But yeah, there are just sometimes one step is the very best thing you can do. And you pray hallelujah for that one. But friend, there's more. There is so much more. And it's not found in figuring it out found in the key trusting him by faith today would you trust him Lord thank you thank you for the moment and thank you for the time thank you Lord for your word that speaks to us thank you Lord that we have something that no one else has 
It's available to all, but not all will participate. Thank you for the privilege, the humble opportunity of trusting in Jesus. Lord, might we be diligent as we encounter the world, sharing with them about your truth and your goodness, your moral authority, your law, your rightness. Might we never get so involved on their turf, Lord, that we forget our standing of faith. Help us, Lord, as we share this faith. We don't prove you. We trust you. Might we tell the story of trust, of faith, of surrender, and might they be saved. Thank you, Lord, for today. It's in your name we pray. Amen.